Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. There have now been millions of cases of COVID in Australia throughout the pandemic. And while some people have returned to full health, others are still suffering the impacts. One of the symptoms of long COVID is brain fog. But what exactly is it? And will that fuzzy feeling ever go away? Someone who understands what it's like is our very own Dr Norman Swan and he joins us now. Norman, you are experiencing sort of symptoms that a lot of people have spoken about. What has this brain fog been like for you? Well, it's not been that bad, but I've experienced, and it's actually getting better now. So for a lot of people with Omicron, it seems to last for about a month. By the way, there's just been a study showing that uh, long COVID, you know, experiencing symptoms after about a month of the infection is down to about 9%, still a lot of people from 30% in people who are triple vaccinated, and as indeed I am. So what it was, was I, I probably five or six weeks ago got infected uh, with probably Omicron. Uh, the reason I think it was Omicron is I didn't have any taste or smell abnormalities, a lot of tea, coughing and so on, settled down. And then just every so often during a day, you literally could feel a bit of a veil going, going over your eyes and you're not celebrating, you know, you're just not thinking as clearly as you, as you, as you might. I remember actually, um, I'm down in Melbourne as we're talking today, and um, I was down in Melbourne and I was having lunch with somebody and somebody else came along and I started talking to them and I thought, I'm speaking absolute rubbish here. I, it, it was just that sort of fogginess. And over a period of time of about four weeks, it's, it's steadily lifted and I'm hardly getting it at all now, but it was very palpable at the time. It's interesting making that distinction because a lot of brain fog, which is not a new thing, is attributed to sort of certain other factors, a hormonal imbalance, stress or illness or inflammation otherwise in the body. Um, how do you know that you've got brain fog as a result of COVID? And it's not just something to do with another issue like stress or fatigue. Well, in fact, it's very interesting you ask that question because people with chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, when you actually ask them about what, and that's, a, you know, that's been around for a long, long time, well, described well over a century ago, is in fact, they're, they're not tired, they're foggy. Um, and and they, they, that's what they describe and they, they, they find that very disabling. And I suppose you just know it when you feel it. Um, I, I can't be more specific than that. You, you don't particularly want to go to sleep. You're not, at the, when I had the acute infection, I just wanted to sleep for hours on end. That's not that. It's just, you're, you're, if, you, if you go on a scale of one to 10 of your brain operation, you drop down to about 60% and you can feel it. And how long do those effects last during a day? And have you been told how long you're likely to experience the tail of this, this, these symptoms? Well, I'm pretty much over it now. Um, and it would, it would last, I think right at the beginning, it might last for an hour or so, uh, in my case. Some people get it for much longer than that. Um, and it, it, would, it just progressively shortened over a month. And the, uh, there was nothing much to bring it on, except that it was more likely in the afternoon than the morning. It was at my sharpest <laughs> in the morning. But um, the, uh, I mean, I'm laughing about it, but I wouldn't be laughing about it if I had it all day, every day. I just had it for a period of time, but I'm pretty much out of it now. What this tells us, Norman, is that COVID is still a massive issue around the world. People are still dying and people are still experiencing the long effects of COVID, that inflammation in the body, long after the effects of the virus have passed. That's right. And it sets up a reaction and your body's, what's called your body's innate immune system, the first front of your immune reaction, which is broad spectrum and it affects your body, it can affect your heart and it can affect your brain. Really interesting study of hamsters with COVID and they've got one of the proteins of Alzheimer's disease in the brain uh, for a, a period of time after they've had COVID. So your brain is reacting in a, in a very specific way to this. It's um, and the, uh, you know, there's still a lot to be learned about it. But thankfully, most people are like me. I mean, Omicron, if you just speak around, it's anecdotal with Omicron. It seems to last about a month, five weeks. But there is a small proportion of people, fortunately with vaccination, much smaller than previously, who do go on to get symptoms beyond a month. We've just passed the milestone of a million deaths in the US. This is clearly still a significant issue. It is a big issue if you think that nearly one in 10 people are going to go on and get this. It's the same as deaths. We've got a lot of deaths at the moment. 
the rate is low because of vaccination, but the number is actually high. And we're not talking about it. We're seeming to pre pre pretend it doesn't exist. And, and, and long COVID I I is hidden. Norman Swan, great to chat with you. Thank you. My pleasure. So what's actually going on inside the brain when you experience brain fog? Professor Tissa Vitaratne is a senior neurologist and he joins us now. Professor, how much does the brain change when someone is experiencing brain fog? Significantly, Jeremy, brain fog in itself is not an illness. It's a symptom that patients explain as we heard from our good friend Norman. Patients generally uh, they explain that they get distracted, they get forgetful, they have difficulty concentrating, they have difficulty performing tasks. Uh, we believe there is significant uh, transient uh, electrical and chemical changes uh, that are occurring in human brain when uh, the patients experience brain fog. So you've sent us an image here of a brain MRI. Tell us what we're looking at here. So in the brain scan, what you are seeing on the right-hand side, uh, the less darker picture with arrows, it shows uh, slightly increased uh, intensity of the signal. So this is the first reported case of uh, post-COVID-19 neurological syndrome from Australia, which is commonly known as long COVID. Uh, this, these scans were done at the acute stage. Not all patients with uh, brain fog does have MRI changes. I'm not saying that these are typical changes of brain fog per se, but I'm using this to show our viewers or listeners uh, that uh, the, the brain changes does occur in COVID-19 and sometimes we can capture them. On the right hand side, uh, we see some of the changes uh, in the vision, uh, the neuronal network, uh, which has about 13 million, million uh, neurons or electrical wires clumped together. So this particular patient had them and then we studied uh, him like a hawk over a couple of months and we saw some of the other changes also and we continue to work on, in this field on other patients as we speak. And so what is it that we're looking there? Is that a sign of inflammation? How long does that last and how severely do those symptoms linger for? Uh, the, the, it's, it's a brilliant question, Jeremy, that I do not know the exact answer for. But having seen hundreds of patients, I could uh, tell you that uh, some patients, uh, these symptoms uh, can linger up to two years. Uh, that's the longest that have seen so far. Most patients, uh, though, they do recover almost completely anything from three to six months and have seen a uh, time interval anything in between also. It, does this mean that the virus is actually present in the brain or is this a side effect down the track after getting COVID? Uh, it doesn't look like that uh, virus uh, does uh, go, go to brain all the time. Again, we have studied this carefully and written on this also. What happened is uh, when we get... Uh, the virus entry into our body, whether it is gastrointestinal system or breathing pathway, the first inflammatory reaction occur locally. But at the same time, it looks like that the barrier between brain and blood seems to break down uh, the, with any infection and more so with the COVID-19 infection. So the inflammatory cascade of chemicals that do occur elsewhere does get to brain and that then sensed by brain protective mechanisms like the army, air force, uh, police inside our brain, these are immune cells uh, or, or members of immune cells, they start uh, to respond to that. Uh, so it is uncommon for us to see virus uh, in brain itself, but it is very common for us to see uh, immune inflammatory reaction as brain is the central processing unit uh, of our amazing human body. And it does respond to this uh, uh, as it is supposed to be doing. And so that could point to inflammation in other parts of the body as well, other key organs like your lungs, your kidneys? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, the although we as specialists uh, the try and operate in our own specialties, me as a brain specialist and uh, my cardiology friends as heart specialist and my respiratory colleagues as respiratory specialists, when we get sick uh, as an organism with this sort of infection, the broader reaction occur impacting other organs also. It's interesting to note that with any infection and any major illness, because our brain is responsible for what we do, how we behave, how we respond, it does seem to get involved almost with every other illness. And it is very clearly shown by COVID-19 beyond doubt to the knowledge that we acquired during the last two years thus far.
Professor Vijaratne, it's so good to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. So, what can be done to treat this? Dr Shalini Arunagiri is a psychiatrist whose research brain fog in relation to women's health. Uh, Dr Arunagiri, thank you for joining us on the program. Um, scientists are obviously still learning about brain fog. It's nothing new. What do we know so far about how to treat it? Yeah, it's really interesting. So brain fog, as we understand it, um, has been around for a little while. It's a subjective term and something that people have referred to in relation to menopause um, and in relation to other sort of mental health syndromes. Um, now we're starting to, to look at it in relation to COVID. And I guess in terms of what we know about it, um, it's a subjective impression of sort of not functioning well, of being fuzzy and that sort of thing. Um, but actually what we're starting to understand is how that relates to objective um, tests of your memory and your functioning and how that actually also impacts on people's day to day. So how do you get around to measuring it? So there's a whole range of kind of cognitive tests that we can do. And in our research, for instance, we've done a range of, of kind of online tests with people. So women going through menopause, for instance, can fill out a survey online and do um, a range of kind of thinking and memory tasks for us to understand how that actually plays a role in how they might function day to day in their workplace or even kind of going about your daily jobs. There's a really interesting impact, too, that some people report the onset of that brain fog in the case of COVID, several months after they've had that initial diagnosis of COVID, why does that happen? Yeah, it's really hard um, to put your finger on it in terms of the research not being quite there yet in relation to COVID. I think what's really great is we're getting so much data coming through from around the world um, by following people up for a period of time after they've had the illness. And so there's a range of things that might be happening for people, um, aside from, for instance, having specific impacts on your thinking and your memory and cognition. People also might have impacts on their mental health, for instance, on their sleep, on their diet or their exercise levels. And all of these will also have kind of a downstream impact on, on your thinking and your memory as well. Um, so it's trying to take all of that together um, and understand what's happening for people some time after they've had that original illness. So how much is in a person's control if they are experiencing brain fog? How much is in their control to sort of fix that or mitigate the symptoms? Yeah, I think from what we understand from other fields of research into brain fog, such as in um, women's mental health, we know that um, making changes to your lifestyle can make a big difference in terms of that impact. And so that's including things like making sure um, sleep is as good as you can get it. Uh, making sure you're getting restful sleep, trying to exercise regularly, um, changes to diet, for instance, as well, getting sunlight and sun exposure. All of these things can make um, a difference in your day to day sort of functioning. One of the things we all experience when we're unwell is this question of whether to soldier on, push ahead or whether to take it easy. What's your advice? Yeah, I think it's a very individual thing. And for many people um, who are trying to manage caregiving or, or other sort of needs at the moment, it's sometimes tricky um, to get that balance quite right. But I think checking in with yourself and, and um, doing what you need to do, I think, and looking after yourself is really important. What about getting the right uh, medical advice around that? If, if these symptoms are kind of hanging over you quite considerably, where yeah. do you go? And is it worth seeking a second opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think with many things, seeing your GP is um, a good idea in the first instance, but also starting to think about, you know, seeing mental health practitioners, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, for instance, if it's starting to impact on, on your kind of mental health as well. Um, also thinking about that bi-directional impact on your mental health, for instance, if you're feeling kind of anxious or low, that itself can affect your thinking and memory. So, you know, actually getting help sooner rather than later is important. This is obviously going to be a massive issue in the years to come, considering how many people are getting COVID. What do you know so far about how long lived these effects might be? I think what we're starting to understand is the um, downstream impacts are very individual. Um, not everyone experiences this, um, this sort of phenomenon of brain fog. And for some people who do, that can be you know, uh, weeks to months. As you said, it can last for quite a lot later. Um, so I think it's really about us being able to do uh, more longitudinal research, to be able to follow up people up over time and understand what that's going to do um, further on down the track. Dr. Shalini Arunagiri, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. From all of us, bye for now.